Okay, I hope you are all energized, you've been inspired, you've been educated. I know we certainly were this morning. I was looking in, I was in the content room, we had some fantastic sessions. I hear the future and the control rooms were also excellent. And we've got two more sessions here, that's all we've got left, guys. But they are two killer sessions to bring us home on the first day of Festival of Media Global 2018. So, we said this morning, we talked about being brave, about being bold. Well, we're going to have a discussion and quite a, a thought-provoking discussion on stage. We have got to join us on stage talking around the new relationship between clients and media owners and platforms. We have got to do that. The CMO for Time Warner, Kristen O'Hara. Let's give her a big round of applause. We've got the GM for Snapchat, Clever Lottie. And... To moderate it expertly and far better than me, we've got Quinton George, the co-founder for Unbound. <laughs> oh, is this working? Yeah. Going here. Perfect. Have I gone in the wrong side? I think we've already screwed Have up I the ceiling. Have I messed it up? It's okay, it's okay. I can swap. Okay. I don't think we can match uh, Jeremy for, uh, for energy, but hopefully the intellectual capital in the room is, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is going to uh, off the charts. If I'm not off the stage yeah, yet. Yeah, don't go off the stage. Really. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Quentin George. Uh, I'm with a company called Unbound. And we're a strategic advisory firm that works um, with CMOs of Fortune uh, 100 companies. Uh, so we've been fortunate enough over the last four years to work with um, Time Warner, helping them with their enterprise data strategy and partnership relations. Uh, and what I would probably say is it's been a relatively new phenomenon that brands are starting to take the lead in creating more strategic relationships and more direct relationships um, with, um, with platform companies. Uh, and so uh, what we're here today to discuss is, uh, is essentially the evolution of that and the experience uh, that these two ladies have had in having crafted a relationship between Time Warner and, um, and Snap for about 18 months or so. Uh, no, it's you know, about a year or so, just a little, a little bit about a year. Um, so with that, uh, uh, Kristen and, um, and Claire, let's, let's kick it off. But first, Kristen, if you can just set context for us. I think a lot of people know about Time Warner, but maybe you can just tell us a little bit about the business that you're in uh, and kind of set up uh, the, the market that you operate in. Sure. Well, we'll start with a little show of hands. Who's watching season two Westworld right now? Hopefully some of you, many of you, excellent. Can't wait for Game of Thrones to come back. Uh, anyone wake up this morning to CNN? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Thank you. Dante. Oh, my God. Uh, no, and, and in the movie business, any, any Ready Player One fans? The new? Yeah? Very good. So, so we're a media and entertainment company at Time Warner. We operate three distinct lines of business, HBO, Warner Brothers, and Turner. Uh, we do that across 200 markets around the world, which is, I think, what brings us here to this amazing city of Rome uh, today. And part of, part of what's going on, you know, we have hugely passionate and engaged fans across those three lines of business, but we're living through a time, really, of radical transformation in the business. Every monetization model has basically been turned on its head. Um, we're in direct-to-consumer businesses that we had never been in before. Um, you know, we... It historically put everything through traditional outlets of distribution. And all of that has changed so much over the past five, three to five years at such a rapid, rapid clip. And I think that is one of the, the reasons that we start to think about partnerships in a different way because the world is moving so fast, we, we can't go it alone. So, so speaking about, about partnerships, and you say you're thinking about it differently, why, why are they so much more important to you now? And can you start to articulate for us you know, how you approach them. Sure. Well, as you, as you hear from the content we have, people around the world rely on us every day to be informed, entertained, or inspired, as the case may be, depending on what type of content we're putting out. And, and really, in today's world, it's our job to not just meet consumers' expectations, but to exceed them. And we need to do that in every distribution outlet, on every screen, and on every platform. And, and it's really... Content itself is not, it just great content is not going to get us to the promised land anymore. And so when we think about 
key strategic partners in distribution, in content, in data? Who are the companies who are going to help us to think differently, advance our cause, and stay on the cutting edge of where consumers mm. are going? Mm. So that brings us to Snap. So Claire, it's been, it's been just over a year as yeah. well since Snap has IPO'd. Uh, what's changed? A lot, <laughs> I bet. And what are you focusing on? Yeah, I'm aging rapidly. Um, <laughs> it's been a busy year, as those of you follow our business uh, closely. I think we established ourselves very early on as a really great uh, brand platform for partners. I think uh, it's fair to say no one would challenge me and say I think we are leading the way in the potential of AR, just looking at kind of the volume of people every day interacting with augmented reality on our platform is phenomenal. Um, I often call us um, a positive disruptor mm -hmm. in the sense that I think we are changing, disrupting what good looks like on mobile uh, as, a, as a mobile platform. Um, I think what's really changing in the past, uh, past year, as well as building on that brand positioning, I think what we've done a great job is really building a performance business really quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think as we carry on this conversation today, I think just pulling out examples actually, even in our partnership with Time Warner, the great work we've done to really demonstrate kind of more performance-led uh, metrics and drive yeah. real business value for partners. So I think it's fair to say all in all, it's been incredibly busy. But I think I really feel really proud that we're continuing to build on kind of the foundations as well as kind of going into this performance space. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, moving that's, fast. That, that's interesting. Now, I, I would say, you know, historically, these types of enterprise deals um, you would ordinarily have done through an agency or a holding company. In my IPG days, I, I would have been giving you a call to try and establish this. But it seems like. Um, uh, Snap, as along, as along with, with some other platforms, are taking a more direct uh, relationship or trying to form more direct relationships and do enterprise deals with brands. What has changed? Um, I should probably start with saying I spent 11 years of my life at, uh, at Mindshare Media Agency. So I think the role of media agencies continue to be incredibly value, uh, valuable to the, to the industry. Um, I think what has changed, you touched on it when you used the word enterprise. This, this is a different type of deal. Mm. This is kind of how I describe kind of multi-layer deal. It's not just about media. We're going to go on to talk about this, but there's various components, including kind of data partnerships, content partnerships, mm. which essentially had to happen. It's a direct conversation because it is an enterprise deal. It isn't, like I said, just a kind of media partnership. So it wouldn't have happened without the uh, dialogue that, that started at a brand level. And to be completely frank, it wouldn't have happened without Kristen's role here of championing the, the partnership and the value of it. Because mm. I always think these things don't happen unless you've got kind of key, key people that believe yeah. and champion making this stuff happen. And to be clear, the agencies are clearly involved. But again, there isn't one agency. You know, Time Warner's business is incredibly complex. There's yeah. a, as Kristen said, many different businesses within it. So there isn't even one agency that we could have called upon to make yeah, it happen. Exactly. So it had to be led from the brand point of view and then, of course, snap partnering with them. Of course. So, so Kristen, so um, let's talk about this particular deal. You know, Time Warner spends billions, I'm not at liberty to say how many billions, <laughs> but a substantial amount of billions uh, in, in don't, marketing. Don't say that too much, Claire. I want more money. <laughs> I always want more money. Uh, it, but I also believe that there is a, a statistic that 80% of incremental spend goes you know, to two players, and it's Facebook and Google. Um, what, you know, how did this deal come about, and, and how, do, how did you think about Snap differently? Yeah, so as Quentin says, so it's about a year into our partnership. I think uh, June was, was our, uh, our, our kickoff. But it really started probably a year or so prior to that, even before we reached out to Snap. And part of that was the C-suite at Time Warner having some strategic conversations about what are we going to do to diversify uh, a digital investment in what had become a duopoly in, in many senses of the word, to your point. And I think when we start to evaluate the landscape 
um, there were two things that, that really struck us, right? Diversification is part of any good investment strategy. Hopefully that's what you all do with your own money, right? You're not just putting it into two stocks, as it were. Although, you know, I'm sure Claire would be fine if it was all in Snap. <laughs> Fun water um, and Snap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but it was really about how do we mitigate risk? And so if you think about it, in the last year, there has been a lot of risk in digital marketing. I think a year ago, March, brand safety wasn't even a phrase that was part of the lexicon of how we go to market. Um, so mitigating risk was a big factor in that. And then the other part was when you think about leverage in the marketplace, with so many brands putting so much investment into companies, it really leaves the industry kind of with very little leverage against key two, two partners. And as the world gets more complex, and, and it's particularly for us, those two companies are getting into the content business, they're bidding for you know, rights for content, they have very deep pockets, and the relationships become incredibly complex. So that, I would say, was the, the stepping mm. stone onto what are the companies that we can look at that can provide value to us in a strategic way and, and we can learn yeah. that. And so, and so in that sense, you know, why, why do you believe Snap deserves a seat at the table? What are the things that are most attractive to you about that? Um, well, because my daughter will say it's so much fun. <laughs> um, and she's only eight, by the way. Um, so I would say it was really three things. And we actually went to the, the Snap management team initially with three tenants that we said, if you guys can come to the table and help us figure this out, we're happy to engage in a more formalized strategic partnership. And the first of which is probably the thing that you're not thinking about when you think of Snap, right? Or at least a year ago, you weren't thinking of Snap, and that was data. And one of the things we've been incredibly focused on at Time Warner is unlocking the data signal across our three lines of business on a global basis. So getting the pipes open between HBO, Warner, and Turner. And for us, on a platform like Snap, where we are both a, an advertiser, but we're also a, a publisher and a content partner, there's a tremendous signal of a very important audience that was happening on this platform and, and Snap was honest, and they said, listen, we're not that far along on the data journey, but we're happy to have you push us and grow. So the second part um, was really the media platform. And what we saw was, you know, our spend was increasing um, in certain pockets of the company, but not consistently, right? They were still growing globally. Um, there were certain areas in our company where there was a, a belief that, well, this platform doesn't really work for us. And so it was our, our theatrical business unit was having great success in the US and, and, and starting to, to globally expand. And we really dug in and said, what is this platform? It has a very highly engaged audience. It is driving results for us in one sector of our business. Uh, it's an audience that's very, very important to us, skewing to millennials. And so how do we take best practices from one part of our company and scale that, particularly with a company that's at a high uh, rate of innovation and a high rate of global growth. And so for us, because we are in 200 markets, when we look at global partnerships, that is really important to us. And then the third piece for us, which Claire touched on, is we are in the content business. It's what we do, whether it's TV, movies, video games, et cetera. But what we haven't done historically, and our DNA is not a mobile-first content company, it's not short form. Um, and so we felt that there was a lot we could learn by partnering with a mobile-first um, short form content player and to look at whether that was existing IP that we have So things that are currently on air. What form does that take within within snap yeah. in the content platform? We can look at new forms of IP that we want to create together or things out of our library yeah. frankly, yeah. so lots but, of opportunity yeah. I could build on that what I love about the time Warner is business particularly you, you really value the fact that we were doing content differently yeah. You recognize that we put a true value on traditional, uh, well-experienced, big publishing brands and content brands. And I think, as a platform, I think we've done that better than anyone else. And I think this partnership is just testament to that, and we're building on that. Yeah. But that, for me, is exciting. When here, Kristen's talking about content being a pillar, I think, for me, it is a really, really key part yeah, of and it. And, and I just build on that, because sometimes we forget the scale that, that Snap has with a particular audience. There's something we're, we're recreating out of our library that I can't speak to because it hasn't been announced yet. <laughs> Um, and it's actually a format of content that's going to hopefully be reinvented on this platform. And when we talk to the content creators, it's very, very niche audience right now. Um, you know, 
100,000, 150,000 audience, and the anticipated audience we're gonna get by relaunching this within their platform is in the millions. And I think all of a sudden content creators go, yeah. what for this little piece of IP that's just kind of chugging along on the side over here, it gives us an opportunity yeah. for reinvention at scale. Yeah. Right, so, um, so how, do you, how do you structure and manage you know, what's clearly a, a global, global yeah. deal uh, in such a fast growing company? Um, it's challenging, you know, there isn't kind of a formula that just works, and I think it takes both sides to really care and want to make it happen, which we've had great people involved in it. I always think it comes back to what are both parties trying to get from it? What are our key kind of objectives? What does value look like? And then when we're really aligned on that, then we focus, and I think really focus on what matters, again, to both sides. Where I think we've done well with this partnership is there clearly was the strategic piece, which is what does it look like, what are the pillars, but actually as much effort's been put on the kind of implementation of it yeah. in terms of actually making it happen, and I think what does it look like it comes back to people, having the right people focused on the right things, and that's the truth, um, and I think as a company, I think Kristen touched on it, is that in the past year, we've really set ourselves up to be global. And I think for us, you know, we've moved very fast to do that rather than kind of be US and rest of the world. It's very much, we're yeah. a global business. We're uh, global and how part. do you, I mean, I, I think most people around the room have been in global roles. You know, you're trying to, you're trying to do one thing at a global level, but you have to have local sensitivities. Yeah. How, how do you manage a deal like this to have, be both global yeah. Uh, and also locally relevant? Yeah, it comes back to value. If people understand the value they can get from something, they lean in. And I think that's what we've done really well. And again, you know, I keep saying uh, thank you to Kristen for that, because I think on your side, you've done a great job of making sure all the different business units, all the different uh, key stakeholders, I've sat in some of these mm. meetings, there are a lot of people around, you know, around the table really outlining what this deal is, what this partnership is, and what value they can expect from it. So I think from the offset, we were really, really clear about what their expectations should be. Yeah. So therefore, then we can go back and not hold people to account, but be really asking those questions. Why aren't you leaning in? Or, or why is that business this unit not getting the value of this one's getting over here? So I think it's a number of things, but I think execution is key. Got it. So, so Kristen, when you talked, when, you, know, you, you talked earlier about the kind of fundamental tenets of the deal, this was always more than just, you know, discounts and efficiencies. Uh, what are some of the, the other aspects um, that you were interested in getting from a partnership like this? I think whether it's this partnership or some of the other big global um, enterprise-wide partnerships that we've engaged on, and, and again, Claire did touch on this, but for us, it, it has to genuinely be a two-way thing. Yeah. And we need to change the mindset of a commercial relationship with this company we're spending money with to really how are we each gonna get the maximum amount of value out of each of our organizations and how are we gonna push the boundaries of innovation mm -hmm. in order to do that. And so if we're not both succeeding at that, then we're not really in partnership. Then we have a commercial relationship and that's, we haven't made any progress. So I'm, I'm happy that's not where we are. Um, I think you know the second piece is, is really setting the clear objectives and these kind of partnerships are really hard, and we don't do a lot of them. And to say it's an investment of time, energy, manpower, new learning, organizational systems, would be an understatement. I mean, it is a massive undertaking to do st global strategic partnerships really well, so we have to be incredibly choiceful. And in a world where we're all pulled in so many different directions, and there can be so many priorities and snaps, you know, inventing a new thing every week. It's being very choiceful about what does success look like and where do we want to focus the collective energies of these two companies to drive success and to drive business outcomes on both sides. And for us, those things were around the data signal and getting really smart about that, becoming best in class in the content, and also best in class of how we activate as an advertiser on their platform. So. The other thing I'll say, though, is this is a two-year partnership, and the world we live in moves so incredibly quickly that being a good partner also <laughs> means having a candid and honest dialogue and to be able to pick up the phone and say, okay, we know we said three months ago this is where we were focused, but let's just take a pause, and is there anything we need to modify, tweak, mm. et cetera? Um, and the last bit is really about a commitment to a learning agenda and innovating, and not just a one-way innovation. And it's the honest feedback loop, the risk-taking, I think, um, as Jeremy said earlier, it's about like 
doing things boldly and making bold choices and making bold decisions. And for us, when Snap comes to us, or another partner even could come to us with new things, when we're strategically engaged, we lean in and we'll say, yes, we'll put our hands up, we'll try it, we don't know if it's gonna work, sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's a disaster. And we're honest about that and say, here are the five things, that the reasons that didn't work. We're not spending billions of dollars, hopefully, on the disasters. But when the things don't work, and it's giving them valuable feedback about, well, in order, if you're gonna roll this out in a more substan yeah. substantive way, here are the things that need to be addressed on it. And I think it's that feedback loop and a commitment mm -hmm. to learn together mm -hmm. Is, is another valuable part. So, so Kristen spoke about data being a fundamental tenant of this yep. relationship. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say Time Warner has pushed harder than, uh, than most. What is, what is it that Snap is able to do today that it couldn't do a year ago in terms of data, in terms of the offering, in terms of yep. the fidelity and those types of things? Well, I think the first thing to say, actually going back to the value of the partnership for, for Snap, has actually been the feedback, that has tremendous value for a business like ours that's moving incredibly mm. fast. Um, I don't know, where do you start with data? I think early on in our journey, actually, from feedback from key partners, we invested really heavily, actually, in third-party uh, data and third-party measurement and all mm. of that space, because that was very much the climate we were in at, at that time. And I think if you fast forward or look at just kind of the past 12 months, um, we have really over kind of really focused a lot on kind of first party and try to share kind of a lot of that data. Now, because of the, the partnership we're in with Time Warner, they're getting access to a lot of that data sure. firsthand. And I think it's really, as well as obviously looking at kind of post campaign, post, you know, the usual things that I call hygiene, um, they're getting now a little bit more of an understanding about really their audience on our platform. Mm. And that's where it becomes interesting. How does that insight, how does that data start to informing what we're doing moving forward? And I think we are really kind of getting ahead of the curve here. Um, and I think they've pushed us to do that. So you're right, yeah. yeah and I, that, that is absolutely a, a huge part of the value we've had from this partnership, being pushed to do better. Well, so, I, I, I mean, let's talk about the pushing for, for a minute. You know, I, I can attest what a demanding client Time Warner is. They're a good client, but they're very demanding. <laughs> Uh, and so, just in terms of what you've learned over the last year, you know, what are some of the lessons that, uh, that has, has informed the organization, informed the yeah. strategy, informed uh, the way you're going forward? Yeah, I think it's understanding that within a huge business like Time Warner, everyone does have different KPIs, different agendas. Mm -hmm. And it's great that we've uh, gone ahead and, and got a global partnership, but making sure, and it's what I started from, to make a deal work, that everyone understands the value they can get from it based on their KPIs or their agenda. I think that's really key. I think one example I love to talk about, which I think we have learned, is that you assume you do a partnership with a business, and you, you when it's a large business like Time Warner, don't make an assumption that everyone knows everything within that business. And I love this example we always talk about, the wonderful company um, Playdemic, which uh, Warner Brothers Interactive acquired. Um, and they're a company based in Manchester in the UK. And I remember I went to that meeting. It was one of our first meetings early on in the partnership and Playdemic were there. And we were having uh, some of the best results in terms of mobile app and store results that we were mm. seeing globally in mm. our business. And being able to kind of introduce that, those sort of learnings into this partnership. And we obviously made the assumption that everyone in Time Warner knew all about Playdemic. Okay. And, what and we doing. barely knew we owned a company in Manchester <laughs> called Playdemic that was having this great success. I, was so. trying, I wasn't sure if I could say <laughs> that's that. That's okay. I was trying to and do I think, I think that's the place when partnerships are working. The partners are really integrated around your business and will come to you to say, hey, wait, there's this amazing thing happening in this pocket of the world. The rest of you can learn from it. And I think we often sit there and say, like, you know, there, there's so much innovation outside of the U.S. that we need to bring back and, and showcase all around the world. And that was a yeah. terrific example. Um, I'm glad you said that, because I yeah. was trying to be more diplomatic. <laughs> um, but I think just building on that, and it wasn't just it opened up kind of for a broader conversations around the gaming business. Actually, it proved to Time Warner overall that the value of kind of doing mobile app and store activity on our platform has, could lead to a lot of great business results, which yeah. I won't go into detail today, given the open forum. But we have seen tremendous success there. But, but you are available afterwards for people who want to sign enterprise deals and you can reveal them. Anytime. <laughs> um, but I think that's just an example when you've got a partnership that how you can absolutely share learnings and then scale very fast. I think the last bit, which I think this is the whole purpose of a partnership. You go from being a transactional partner mm. to a strategic partner, whereby we were just kind of taking briefs, yeah. coming up with great campaign ideas. 
which actually isn't getting the real value out of our platform, really the, the real insight of what's going on on, on Snapchat. And then when you think about when I talked about AR, about what we can be doing there creative, from a creative point of view. Yeah. So for me, I think when I look at all the different things, it's working really well because all of those things are happening. But we've had some bumps along the way, as you of do. Course. And it's, to Christmas point, it's when we have those open dialogues and we talk about what hasn't worked and how we learn from that. Of course. Um, so for the CMOs and brands uh, that are in the room, uh, and I'll pose this question to both of you, what, what advice do you have for them as they approach this, uh, this new kind of enterprise partnership types of deals? Okay. Um, I think it's not going in with like a brief, okay? Really take it back and don't just pocket kind of, if you want to class as media owners, platforms. Yes as kind of, oh, I'm just going to go and speak to a media owner. Just think about, the, these are challenges I'm trying to solve for or opportunities I believe in my business and have a conversation. And that's when it becomes interesting. And actually, we end up sometimes thinking of things that we may not even come up with yeah. just from having that conversation. But when it's very, here's a brief, we want to do a partnership and it looks like that, it started from a very transactional place, and I don't think you get the most value out. And I think the other piece, and again, it's not because she's Kristen sitting here, is that you need a very senior stakeholder that's going to champion it because it's hard work. And if someone's not that champion in your business, then it's never going to get off the ground. Yeah. And follow through. She, she hasn't walked away. I, we still <laughs> see her a lot. She's still very much leaning in, and that's also key. So it's not just, I've done a deal, isn't it great? Now, how do we make it work? And that's why it's working. Got it, got it. Yeah. And I, I mean, one of the things that I often say to our organization is to have great partners, we need to be great partners. <laughs> and that really is at the bedrock of all of it. You know, we can't go back on our heels and say, no, this is too hard. We're not going to do it. We have to keep pushing. We have to keep trying. And we need to, to stand up and just lean in, to your point, yeah. to really partnering and getting... It gets messy. It's hard. Um, and so a huge part of it comes from education across the organization. Yeah. And, you know, just because we sign a piece of paper and there happens to be an announcement in the Wall Street Journal about it, does not mean every single marketing executive at Time Warner is like, yay, let's go do this. Uh, we get on planes, we go explain to people why this matters to us, and it certainly is not about the financial incentives. It's really about how can we have better business outcomes by being smarter about the platforms um, in which we're engaging. And so a tremendous yeah. amount of education and then knowledge sharing. I think Claire, frankly, was incredibly humble on this playdemic example because <laughs> I, I, it was like a flag I carried through our company to say, you know, as we get more direct to consumer and OTT platforms become more important and we're in the app install business, whether that's, you know, uh, through HBO, products we're launching at Warner Brothers, mobile games that we're creating, et cetera. This is new to us, and we need to be better at how we do it well and do it efficiently in terms of driving app install. So this tiny little seed of an example that was happening in Manchester is something that actually opened up Snap as a consideration platform. And, and our team at HBO, actually a few months after that, had incredible success um, with HBO Now and that app install product, which it had significant impact on our business. So we've got... Just over three minutes left, and Jeremy, I don't want to rob the audience of the opportunity of asking questions, so maybe there's just one or two questions that we can accommodate, but with, you know, with two real practitioners, I thought it'd be a pretty useful. Anybody? Any questions? I can't see. Hi. Um, you, you didn't talk much about the business model and how, from that, the business model of your partnership. So can, I, can you give us some insight into, do, does Snap actually invest in the co-creation of the content, or does that responsibly just sit with Time Inc? Um, How much are we going to uh, Yeah, I, I believe I had to sign an NDA about the terms of our partnership. Um, <laughs> and, I, you know, there are, you know, financial components to it, there are creative and content components to it, and there are data components to it, all of which working together we feel um, benefit uh, very our organization in terms of outcomes. Um, in terms of the specifics, though, I can't really get into it, but I will say we have dedicated teams dedicated to our business, both on the, the media platform, on the content creation piece, as well as on the data piece. And I yeah. think that is something that is really helping us to drive results 
pretty significantly. And those people who are, or teams that are dedicated, are dedicated at an enterprise-wide basis globally. And so that's part of where the success and the magic yeah. starts to happen. But it just to be clear, the three pillars, the content, uh, data, and media, are all connected. So they're not happening in silos. So you can use your imagination now to think about how it's not just kind of a commercial deal, that they're connected. Other question? Microphone over there. Hi, I'm Sneha. I work at PhD in London. That was a very interesting dialogue. Uh, and we work with the world's leading brand, so it's also fascinating to see how uh, partnerships work in this context. But you mentioned, you talked about KPIs a few times, and I know you probably can't divulge any detail, but you said that you had separate KPIs at a global level and separate KPIs at a local level. At a strategic level, do you still have KPIs that link back to your three tenants that you talked about, which were data, content, and uh, creativity? Or is it just each team goes out and has their own? No, I think, I think the, the media, the creative, uh, the content, and the data is an underlying foundation for all of our businesses. I think when Claire yeah. was mentioning that we have different KPIs, you know, you can imagine launching a major global theatrical franchise has different KPIs than um, exactly. the mobile yeah. app install of a new video game or you know, a new television series that's second season coming back. And so I think how we're using the platform is different for each of yeah. our lines of business or the specific product for which we're going to market. And I think we're sensitive to making sure that we set the right KPIs for all of those different um, campaigns, but at a, at a macro level, really focusing on being best in class from a data a creative execution as an advertiser and as a content creator on the platform. Yeah. Hi, Christine. Here. Yeah, Hello. that's hi. Oh, 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 oh. Christine. Hello. <laughs> okay, wait, also. Hi there. I'm Mariana. I work uh, at Omnicom in Chile, and I was wondering uh, how we can take advantage of a small market as a testing market. Uh, and how we can deal with this partnership uh, in, in our country. Sure. Well, I think, uh, as Claire mentioned, you know, um, our agency partners, you know, are critical in helping us to bring the, the, the strategy and the vision to life. And so in part, it's working with the brand teams in the market and identifying, a lot of times we'll say like, how do we just pick a campaign and get started and start to push the boundaries and learn? It's not always about doing the biggest, best thing first, right? It's picking really focused campaigns where we can start to prove the value proposition o over time. And I think that's where we've seen the, the best success um, and, you know, gaming for us was a great example of how that, that can then carry through. And it was, you know, a, a, a relatively smaller budget initiative that then has, you know, out of a market that then has driven a ton of innovation and partnership in a division of yeah. our company that we frankly weren't expecting. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think the local market activation is incredibly critical. But interesting, some of the best work happens in the smaller markets. It's the markets that see the value and lean in and go and just ask for the things out of the partnership. So I would say, onus is on you, lean in and ask, because absolutely the value that the framework is there for you to benefit from. Dante, it sounds like you need to go to Chile. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I believe our time is up. So a round of applause for our wonderful panelists. Thank you.